Hi, welcome to episode 5 of What They Saw. Today I'm very excited to bring to you A Rebel in Pickett's Charge by John H. Lewis. Uh, and this episode, I am thrilled to say I had the time to hang out and take some pictures and some videos at Civil War Tales in Gettysburg, which is probably one of the coolest destinations in Gettysburg, up there with the battlefield. Uh, it is a diorama of Pickett's Charge. They have a diorama of Andersonville, of the Monitor and the Bear Mac. They're working on a diorama of Little Round Top uh, amongst a bunch of different little dioramas. Perfectly researched. Uh, incredible. Uh, they have 9,000 little soldiers. Uh, one of the greatest parts about it is that they're all cats. Anyway, you got to go check it out. So the pictures and the videos of John H. Lewis and Pickett's Charge are from Civil War Tales. Uh, the reading is from A Rebel in Pickett's Charge. Thanks. So John H. Lewis was a lieutenant in the 9th Virginia Infantry, Army of Northern Virginia. And he prefaces his account with the following. The author of this little book... John H. Lewis, does not claim to scholar, nor must the reader expect to find any great deal of scholarship, but it's only the plain statements of act experiences and facts as he saw them, described in highway. Naturally, after the lapse of years, memory is slightly at fault in many things, but the incident facts in this book were so indelibly oppressed upon the mind of the writer that the errors are few, if any, and the opinions of the author in this book must be considered by the reader and taken for what they are worth. Without their apology, I submit to my comrades in the public my recollections. I'd like to start Lieutenant Lewis's account in Gettysburg on July 2nd, 1863. It was with Armistead's brigade, and he writes, At night, July 2nd, the men were resting on their arms, worn out with the day's fighting and thinking of comrades who had fought their last fight. Thousands of homes, both north and south, would be filled with sorrow for the husband, father, or brother who would never come again. The silent stars looked down on the faces of the dead and blushed for the passions of men. The wounded were being cared for as well as possible under the circumstances, and the living were thinking of the morrow. Thus passed the night. July 3rd, 1863. Dawned, and all was activity. Both commanders were astir early, and in counsel with their subordinates, this day, perhaps, would determine the success or failure of one of these armies. Meade, during the night, had straightened his line and was in better condition than the day before. Lee viewed his lines, looking for the place that might show some signs of weakness, but found none he had tried both wings, and now, after due reflection, determined to strike the center of Meade's army. And if he could, break through and reach the Baltimore Pike, then goodbye to Meade's army, and his head would fall in the basket. Thus we would find the situation on the morning of July 3rd, 1863. This day was to become one of the days memorable in history. Yet the quiet that had prevailed in the early morning gave no signs that within the radius of ten miles were concentrated nearly 150,000 soldiers, and that two days fighting had taken place in the vicinity. Yet such had been the case, and at the time every house and barn within miles around were filled with the wounded of two armies. Soldiers know little of what's taking place outside their immediate commands. They hear the roar of artillery and the crash of battle and see the wounded coming from the front and hear all kinds of rumors and reports. And there, their knowledge ends. Lee having determined to make the attack, the orders were given to Longstreet, and he began to make ready for the attack. Pickett's division of Virginia troops, to which I belonged, again, the 9th Virginia, had arrived on the evening before. I shall tell this from actual knowledge. We had moved from Chambersburg in the early morning of the 2nd, and marching 27 miles, halted and went into camp about four miles in the rear of the line of battle. We knew that a severe battle was going on in the front, and we also knew that there had been a fight on July 1st, and that our army had been very successful. Although the roar of artillery was sharp at the front, and the wounded were being taken to the rear, we of Pickett's division were tired and hungry, and paid attention to the part of hunger at once. After eating and resting a short time, we were ready to hear the news of the day. Of course, rumors of all kind reached us, 
it was finally known to us that while the battle was somewhat in our favor, that it was not decisive. As early as nine o'clock that night, we knew that our services would be required in the morning, but there were hopes that it was for pursuit only, as our division was the reserve of the army. As early as three o'clock in the morning of the 3rd of July, the division was stirring and under arms, ready to move forward. We little dreamed what was before us on that memorable day. We moved slowly forward, and about 10 o'clock we took position on the line of battle, facing Meade's left center and on the right of Hill's division, and slightly in advance. It soon became known that our, Pickett's division, was to attack. It had been slightly hazy with fleeting clouds, but the sun had come out in all its brightness, and it was extremely hot and oppressive on the men. Many of them were in the open field. As the day progressed, it became a certainty that we were on the eve of something desperate. And finally, each regiment, regiment was informed what it had to do and what was expected of it. Up to this time, near one o'clock, all had been quiet. Artillery had been moving into the line and taking position, but there was not even an occasion shot to disturb the quiet. About one o'clock, the sound of two Whitworth guns broke the stillness and immediately 125 guns all along the line joined in. In a few moments, the Federals opened up with about 80 guns and joined in the infernal din that fairly shook the mountains. The smoke soon darkened the sun, and the scene produced was similar to a gigantic thunderstorm, the screeching of shot and shell producing the sound of whistling blasts in the winds. Men seldom ever see or hear the like of this, but once in a lifetime and those that saw and heard this infernal crash and witnessed the havoc made by shrieking, howling missiles of death as they plowed the earth and tore the trees will never forget it. It seemed that death was in every foot of space and safety was only in flight, but none of the men did that. To know the tension of mine under fire like that, it must be experience. It cannot be told in words. There is nothing to which I could compare it, so as it would be made plain to one who'd never been there. For two long hours this pandemonium was kept up, and then, suddenly as it commenced, it ceased. For a few moments, all was quiet again. Then was to come the work of death. I was a member of Armistead's brigade. The command attention was heard, and the men rose from the ground where they'd been lying during the fire of artillery. If I should live a hundred years, I shall never forget that moment or the command was given by General Louis A. Armistead on that day. He was an old army officer and possessed of a very loud voice, which could be heard by the whole brigade. Being near my regiment, he gave the command in words as follows. Attention, 2nd Battalion. Battalion of Direction Forward. Guides, Center. March. I never see at any time a battalion of soldiers, but what it recalls those words. He turned, placed himself about twenty paces in front of his brigade, and took the lead. His place was in the rear, properly. After moving, he placed his hat on the point of his sword and held it above his head in front of him. Much had been written of this charge, and it has become historical. It's not egotism in me to be partial, because I was a soldier in it. For this charge and the gallantry shown by this division on that occasion is not only the property and glory of its men, not only the glory and pride of Virginia, but it belongs with all its glory to the entire people of the South, as much so as do the deeds of the Confederate armies. Therefore, I am simply trying to describe this onset of Pickett's division with a truth and accuracy as I saw it, and as I recollected it, and will not try to exaggerate the action of the division or cast reflection upon others. In a battle like Gettysburg, when all did their duty, when men faced death with seemingly no fear, when nearly every state in the South was represented, and today have to mourn the loss of hundreds of their sons, whose bodies sleep beneath the soil of Pennsylvania in unmarked but honored graves, when these same sons in life as one grand whole made up the Army of Northern Virginia, commanded by that great and noble man Robert E. Lee, I saw that the acts of every regiment, brigade, and division of every officer and soldier added glory to that army, 
that it was the property of all and should be cast aside any feeling or thought that would tend to cloud the title of any to an equal share in the glorious deeds of that army, which the world has admitted to have been one of the greatest in all respects of modern times. With this explanation of my position, I shall proceed. I said that this charge had become historical, and yet little has been said of the gallant Armistead. Therefore I must devote some few words to him. With his hat on his sword, he led his brigade being in front of it and cheering it on. His men saw him, they saw his example, they caught his fire and determination, and then and there they resolved to follow that heroic leader until the enemy's bullets stopped them. It was his example, his coolness, his courage that led the brigade over that field of blood through a fire of shot and shell that the world had scarcely ever witnessed before, and the survivors of that brigade wherever met will testify to his gallantry and their love and respect of his memory. The division moved forward at command in common time, and as it cleared the woods, its work was seen before it. Long lines of bristling bayonets, the blackened mouth of numerous artillery, which at the time were quietly awaiting to deal death and destruction to us. But the men in that line, by their steady step and well-dressed line, seemed to be determined to do or die. The writer of this was a second lieutenant and file closer at that time, that is, in the rear of his company, and could see all that was in front. All was quiet. We had cleared the woods and advanced about two hundred yards. We had about one mile to go before reaching the Federal lines. Suddenly, about fifty pieces of artillery opened on our lines. The crash of shell and solid shot, as they came howling and whistling through the lines, seemed to make no impression on the men. There was not a waver but all was steady as if on parade. Forward was the command, and steady, boys, came from the officers as we advanced. Crash after crash came the shot and shell. Great gaps were being made in the lines, only to be closed up in the same steady move forward. The division was being decimated. Its line was shortening, but steady as ever, the gallant armist said, still in the lead, his hat working down the hilt of his sword, the point having gone through it. He seemed to be as cool as if on drill. Whew. With not a sound of cannon near. We were nearing the Emmitsburg Road. There were two fences at that road, but they were no impediment. The men go over them and reform and forward again. At this point, the crash of musketry was added to the roar of artillery. Men were falling in heaps. Up to this time, no shot had been fired by this division. Within 300 yards of the Federal Works, Garnett's brigade gave up their usual shell and strike the double quick. At a hundred yards, they deliver their fire and dash at the works with the bayonet. Kemper's brigade takes up the yell, fire, and dashes at them with the bayonet. Armistead, who's a little to the left and rear, catches the enthusiasm, joins the yell, and on the run, Armistead fell back to the rear to give his brigade a chance to fire. They fire and rush at the works into the assistance of Garnett and Kemper. Their shouts, fire, smoke, clashing of Eris. Death is holding high carnival. Pickett has carried the line. Garnett and Kemper are both down. Armistead dashes through the line and, mounting the wall of stone, commanding, Follow me! Advances fifty paces within the Federal lines. And is shot down. The few that followed in them, that had not been killed, fall back over the wall. And the fight goes on. Death lurks in every foot of space. Men fall in heaps, still fighting, bleeding, dying. The remnant of the division, with scarcely any officers, look back over the field for assistance that should have been there. But there are no troops in sight. They had vanished from the field, and Pickett's division, or what was left of it, is fighting the whole Federal center alone. We see ourselves being surrounded. The fire is already from both flanks in front, but yet they fight on and die. This cannot last. The end must come, and soon there is no help at hand. All the officers are down, with few exceptions, either killed or wounded. Soon, a few of the remnant of the division started to the rear, followed by shot, shell, and musket balls. Out of 4,800 men in line that morning, there was not more than 600 left to tell the tale of our annihilation. Fully 60% were dead or wounded and the balance in the hands of the enemy. 
This ended the Battle of Gettysburg. This was an excerpt from A Rebel in Pickett's Charge by Lieutenant John H. Lewis of the 9th Virginia Infantry. I'd like to once again thank Civil War Tales in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania for their hospitality. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.